real honor to be here with you today. So Bob and I had not met until this morning, but when I was starting out as a cub reporter in the business world, I mean, Bob was just a towering figure, um, as was said, a legendary figure in business. Um, he had a legendary rise at GE. Uh, he ran Home Depot, ran Chrysler, now is advising companies involved in startups, as we'll hear. And I think that uh, it's so helpful to have Bob here today to talk about the theme today, eclectic convergence, this idea that CEOs and leaders are just facing unprecedented amounts of change. So we're going to talk about Bob's perspective on all these changes as well as his own career journey. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so if Bob is brief, it's because I told him we have so much to cover. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, why don't you first put this whole shift we're seeing in perspective for us. At Fortune, where I work, all, it's all we're talking about now, this rapid pace of change, digital disruption, the cloud, AI. I mean, this, this is, really feels like it's something we have just really never been through before. So are things really moving that much faster than they did when you were, I don't know, at GE? Um, how big a shift is this, and what does it mean for leadership, you know, what do today's CEOs need to excel at that maybe they didn't have to 20 years ago? Yeah, there's no question, uh, Lee, and, and uh, the rate of change is unprecedented. You know, when I started uh, as a Cub employee <laughs> with General Electric in 1971, you know, there was, uh, there was pretty much clarity as to the constituencies with which you had to be concerned with. And today, I think it is broader and it's deeper. I like to say that the only, uh, you know, the only certainty is change, and the rate of change has multiplied significantly. CEOs today have to be so concerned with not only the environment, social, and governance, the ESG thing that we talk about, but if you are not innovating, and we heard a lot about that this morning, you either innovate or you will evaporate in today's world. And uh, you know, we've all read the books about good to great, uh, my book is going to be great to gone. And, and unfortunately, the landscape is, you know, is spewing with a number of legendary companies that don't exist today because I think you know, success leads to complacency. And I think that uh, there, there tends to be a comfort level by which people tend to operate and they, they tend to ignore the rate of change and the disruptors that are out there, to your point. Great. We'll talk a little bit more about that for sure. But I, I do want to talk about your bio. You mentioned um, starting out at GE. You joined as a manufacturing engineer in 1971 and uh, spent basically 30 years working your way up and became CEO of GE Transportation and then CEO of GE Power Systems and a key protege of GE's legendary CEO, Jack Welch. At the time, GE was the most coveted place to work. It was also a CEO university. This is where people went, I mean, under Jack Welch, to learn how to become great leaders. What was your trajectory there like, and what did it teach you about leadership and running companies? Well, first of all, I was, I was unbelievably fortunate and blessed to, uh, to be able to join General Electric. When I graduated in 1971, the market was really flat. And uh, so I took a test and was going to sell Metropolitan Life Insurance. And then I was offered an opportunity to join the management training program at Ponderosa Steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and then God looked down upon this young lad and said, geez, give him a break. <laughs> and uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me and my family. Uh, you know, so I started as a manufacturing engineer and immediately went into the two-year rotational training program at General Electric, which it is so noted for. And then immediately went in and got my MBA at the University of Louisville, uh, going you know three nights a week and Saturday, uh, because you know GE is notorious for moving people. We moved 13 times, my family and I. My moved my daughter her senior year. My oldest son went to three high schools. My next son moved his senior year, and only my youngest son actually finished uh, the high school that he that he started at. So it was. Uh, you know, if you have aspirations, and it doesn't mean everyone has to, uh, if you're competent and you continue to improve upon everything you do, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, I like to talk about horizontal promotions. And I had a lot of horizontal promotions. My view was the broader my base, the stronger I'll be as I move up uh, with increasing levels of responsibility. 
and, and it doesn't mean you have to, but it means you certainly should think about it. A lot of, a lot of men and women that I was peered with you know, wanted to grow vertically. I got criticized a lot of times. Geez, Bob, why do you want to go run the assembly lines at General Electric? You know, you're there from six in the morning till nine at night. You've got four assembly lines, 150 people elbow to elbow, and you're punching out three units a minute. And, you know, the things they don't teach you in undergrad or graduate uh, that I had to learn through that was the importance of attention to detail, looking at productivity, looking at quality, and dealing with someone coming into my office and say, I really don't want to work next to that person because they have body odor. And, and so they don't really teach you about that. The other thing they didn't teach me was how to handle four congressional hearings, but we'll talk about that too. Wow. <laughs> uh, what was it like being mentored by Jack Welch, otherwise known as Neutron Jack? He was known as you know, famously ruthless. Cut 10%, the lowest 10% performers wow. every year. Cut any business you're not number one or two in. What was that like? Well, again, I was, I was very fortunate. Uh, Jack and I developed a, a relationship very early. Uh, I was in, in appliances at the time when he became vice chairman, and we were putting on a technology conference, and I was introducing a new concept called sublimation. And uh, we kind of hit it off then, and, and we became you know, great friends, and he was a tremendous supporter. And I think there's you know, a lot of things that you learn. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I had with uh, this one individual I was working for, I said, John, you know, I've learned a lot from you. And he got very proud. He said, what, what is that? I said, well, I learned what not to do. <laughs> I said, you know, in your case, every issue is a nail and you've got to be a hammer. And so I think it's important to learn and emulate those things that fit your culture, your profile. And it's also important to learn what not to do. I, I, I always share with a group like this, you know, what has served me well is to listen learn and then lead. And as I've moved through you know, a variety of different positions at General Electric, and then I left General Electric for a little while, uh, I call it a sabbatical to run case construction equipment. And then Jack asked me to come back, but you know, some of these anecdotal stories, Jack said, you know, I really can't reward you for coming back because people will think, well, I've got to leave to come back. So I'm gonna, you, know, you gotta go to purgatory for a while. And, and I don't mean this derogatory about being in Toronto, Canada, <laughs> but, but he, sent me all, he, he sent me out of the country, I guess, to cleanse me a little bit. And, uh, but then I was fortunate to come back. But working for Jack was, uh, you know, obviously uh, helped shape my career and really put me in a position to, uh, to enjoy a lot of different, uh, different fields. You were one of three candidates to replace him when he decided to retire, and uh, many thought you were the favorite. He had called you the best operating executive he had ever seen. But Jeff Immelt, Immelt got the job, and you left. We, we'll talk about that in a minute, but what was that experience like? Yeah, well, it was interesting, to, to be honest with you. When I started in 1971, Reg Jones was the chairman of the company, and part of the program was one of, one of the training programs. List the number of people between you and Reg Jones. So I started writing these down, then I flipped the page, <laughs> and I kept writing and writing. So to be honest with you, you know, when I started at General Electric and I, I talked to groups like this, I'll get a question, well, how much were you making, you know, in 1971? I said $9,600. And, and a lot of times, you know, the graduate student will say, is that a week? And I said, no, that was, <laughs> that was a year, $9,600 a year. And, and my wife and I, we've been, we've been together since 1966. I remember saying, gee, Sue, if we can just make, you know, like $100,000 a year, wouldn't it be great? And so I never really, uh, and I would advise you to have aspirations. Don't wear them on your sleeve, but work diligently. Make sure you're focused on your job. Do that well. And, and then I took every opportunity, as I said before, to learn and be involved as a manufacturing engineer on the floor. You know, I, I, I volunteered to be part of the feature and appearance programs uh, with marketing in the appliances. So we introduced sublimation. We introduced, I was the first one to introduce powder paint. Uh, we did roll forming and anodizing to improve the feature, the fit, and the quality. So I, I think always accept opportunities. Sometimes do what other people won't do, and you will distinguish yourself. It's very important that you have and build your own brand. 
Jack's brand uh, about Neutron Jack. Uh, you know, fast forward 20 years as the chairman and CEO, no one remembered Neutron Jack. They just remembered him as the CEO of, the, what was it, the decade? You guys named him the decade, the century, yes. the universe, whatever it was. <laughs> we gave him some awards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it was, a, it was a great experience, and I learned a lot, and I was able to really transport a lot of those fundamental qualities. You talked about a, you know, a, a university for CEOs, and it's true. If you look around today, and you go, you know, you got uh, Dave Cody was at Honeywell, uh, my good friend Jim McNerney, 3M and Boeing. You look at Scott Donnelly running Textron. You look at Craig Arnold running Eaton. I mean, I can go down the list. George Oliver running JCI. These are all protégés of coming out of that university. All men. <laughs> uh, we're in a different era now. We're in a different era now. Um, I work on Fortune's Most Powerful Women franchise, so I, I, I have to fly that flag. Um, let me ask you, so GE now, the company that allowed you to build this career there, I mean, and had this reputation as such a superbly managed company, is really yeah. now on its heels. We did a big, my colleague Jeff Colvin did a big story earlier this spring called What the Hell Happened to GE? Mm -hmm. That was the headline. Uh, its stock has cratered. I mean, it's fallen more than 70%. $6, I think it is, right? Well, that was uh, Goldman's that was, Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, uh, Jeff Immel stepped down in 2017, and a few months ago, his successor, John Flannery, was ousted. What mm -hmm. do you think went wrong? Well, um, you know, Jack should have picked Jim McNerney or something. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm only kidding. Jeff's a good friend, and uh, I, I certainly don't want to be uh, critical of an individual. There's enough, mm -hmm. you know, culpability between management and board, I think, uh, to go around as Jeff's put in his article. It, it's, um, so I have two heartbreaking moments. One was when I wasn't selected uh, to run General Electric. You know, it's, um, and Jack and I, it, it was a scene out of Casablanca, really. It was Thanksgiving weekend, and he flew into Albany at the FBO, and you know, it was dark and cold and, you know, dreary. And, uh, you know, he said he made the decision to go with Jeff. And, of course, uh, you know, I guess a little bit of pugnaciousness. I said, well, you know, let's do an autopsy because, you know, we had the best numbers. We had the best employee morale, best vendor relationship, best customer. And I just thought that, um, you know, that, and I'm sure Jeff did and Jim did, all felt they deserved the opportunity. So, but, you, you know, you don't, train yourself to come in second, right? You know, Belichick doesn't go to the Super Bowl and say, now, Brady, I, I want you to come in second, right? <laughs> you know, when I was living in Louisville, not one of the horse trainers ever said, I only want my horse to come in second. So I was, I was very fortunate. Um, I went to work Monday. Uh, I was interviewed on Wednesday. I went to Atlanta on Saturday and took over Home Depot on Monday. Wow. So I was kind of out of work for a week. <laughs> well, that's the thing. The world knows what, you know, rising that high at GE means. I mean, you know, the instant one person's can pick the two others aren't, those are two other CEOs yeah. uh, somewhere else. So Yeah, G Jim immediately went to 3M, and I was fortunate to go to Home Depot. But I think, you know, I think it's a perfect example of what got you here doesn't always get you there. And you certainly have to continue to have, you know, yeah. Peter Drucker says it best, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so with a conglomerate of that size and that complexity, you can't try to change the culture to a softer, gentler, less accountable organization. And you have to understand the details. You have to have grown up in an industrial environment. I, I've commented a couple of times lately, I, I don't think conglomerates are out of favor. I think the ability to provide the leadership, to have mission and purpose, is missing in running conglomerates. If you look at what Dave Cody did when he went to Honey, Honeywell, he had you know, tremendous growth, right? And so even at Home Depot, we were able to go in five years, uh, when, when I went there with the team, it was 40 billion. When I left five years later, it was 90. Uh, we opened a new store every 48 hours. We went from 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, we tripled. We tripled the earnings. Uh, we created Home Depot supply from zero to eight billion. We went from first from zero to number one in Mexico, Canada. 
Uh, we tried to go to China and we screwed that up totally. Uh, <laughs> Not the first. Yeah, so I mean, we, 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 weren't, we weren't sensitive to it's a different culture in that you know, the US is uh, do it yourself. China was do it for me because labor rates were so low it, and the volumes, the homes were smaller. So we, we, you know, that's one we really screwed up. Despite all those achievements at Home Depot, the stock didn't really move. Um, so, nope. so and, and, and you resigned after six years, after yeah. a good, good amount of time. So um, what, what, why don't you think so? Why do you think that? You know, uh, it still eludes me today. And it's probably one of my biggest performance disappointments is, um, you know, when you have that kind of phenomenal growth, when the team is working you know, unbelievably well together, totally synchronized, focused on customer satisfaction, focused on product innovation. We had a 100,000 square foot bunkered facility. So if you go to Home Depot and you see Rigid, Ryobi, Hampton Bay, Glacier Bay, Husky, Workforce, blah, 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 all, those are all house brands. And every time we disintermediated one of our suppliers, we picked up 30 points of margin. So that's why we were able to almost triple the earnings and we were creating tremendous cash flow, bought $7 billion of stock back at the time, increased the dividends from almost zero to a, to, to a dollar. And I'll be honest, I could not get the stock to move. Fast forward, you know, a couple months ago, it was trading at $200. So, um, you know, Frank Blake, uh, who I brought in, uh, succeeded me, and then Craig Manier that's running it today, you know, I had him as the head of merchandising. So I couldn't be happier for them and the shareholders. They're doing a great job. I want to get your thoughts. I have a lot of more leadership questions to ask you, but we just got to finish the, the, the trajectory because from there you went to Chrysler. Yes. And I assume that's what you're referring to when you talked about the four congressional hearings. Yeah. So, so again, I thought... This was right before the financial crisis. Yeah. You know, so I had this strong industrial experience and then was able to you know, blend that with retail. And the combination of two, I think, really was perfect for the auto industry. And uh, I loved the auto industry. I loved being up in Detroit. The people were great. It, I'm gonna give you one little anecdotal story. So I was telling Steve Feinberg, who's the founder of Cerberus, who I, you know, is brilliant, brilliant individual. I said, I really have to make sure that the president of the UAW buys into this thing. And Ron Gettelfinger and I still talk, we're friends today. So I went down to the union hall and he came out with a stack like this and then one sheet of paper. And I thought, oh man, what's gonna happen now? So he turns this over, he said, you know, your old boss wanted to put factories on a barge so that uh, he could always move to the lowest labor. So he started flipping these articles over about Jack. And then he flipped one over a, in a, a blank sheet of paper. So, you know, I couldn't find one negative story about you relative to your relationships and working with the labor management and so forth. So you've got my support. And I, I was tickled to death and that was the start of a great relationship. Uh, you know, when we went there, Again, one of the things I've learned is be respectful of the past, don't live in the past. So I had somewhat of the advantage of looking at the market the way it was, not the way you want it to be, and we saw it starting to get frothy, so we started to put in some cost control. We, uh, we were able, because we were a private at that point, we cut a few platforms out immediately where we were losing about $500 on the hood of each of these vehicles. We started to you know, look at cost, we started to look at capacity, uh, and then the market felt, you know, the financial market just went away. And, you know, the FICA score to be able to get a loan was up at 750. You had to put $5,000 down. And so, uh, unfortunately, we had to, we sold a billion dollars of non-earning assets because cash was king. We were burning about a billion dollars a month. Uh, we, took, we took $5 billion of cost out. We had to, unfortunately, furlough 35,000 families. Uh, but we managed to keep Chrysler alive. And uh, we went through that whole process of bankruptcy. We were in and out in 30, 36 days, I think. And, uh, but again, there was four congressional hearings and, and uh, those are painful. <laughs> so let's cut to today. We're, we seem to be in such a different era now. Um, instead of the big industrial companies, everyone seems to be obsessed with Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Uh, and, and with it has come a new crop of leaders, not to mention all the startups we, you know, we've seen. How, how is leadership different today than it was back yeah. then? Well, I'm still trying to get used to, um, I'm trying to get used to businesses 
that generate no earnings and have unprecedented market cap. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Aren't old school. All? I always thought you had to have revenue and earnings. And uh, so I'm always amazed at these companies, but listen, they are where they are, and, and maybe that's why they're doing so well. But I, 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 think, I think today uh, we'll talk about a couple of things if we can. Mm -hmm. You know, the general consensus, uh, I was with about 150 CEOs, and the general consensus is that the GDP will be about 3.7% through 2020, well up from where we were. The general consensus is regulation rollback has been tremendously helpful. Uh, corporate tax, certainly for small businesses who have to report on, on a personal basis, uh, has been very helpful. If you look at the repatriation of funds offshore, has allowed significant reinvestment, and the tax associated with that has certainly helped on the deficit. Uh, if you look at uh, the forecast of 3.7, Larry Lindsay did a, a regression analysis, and basically the CEO group has been more right than wrong over the years. If you look at the impact of tariff, most of the CEOs are saying, we probably could recover 2.7 to 3.4% in price. We'll probably get some vendor concessions. The rest will have to come out of productivity. We think we can handle about a 10% tariff. Now, if you look at the, the uh, producer price index that came out today, uh, so between the lip and the cup, as that moves through, we'll see whether the companies have pricing authority, pricing power, and if the consumer can absorb that. lead. So that's gonna be, that'll be a big issue for us to handle. What companies out there or technologies out there are most impressive to you these days? Well, I, I do think, you know, coming out of the automotive industry, I think the, the regulatory changes, what Mary Bauer has done at GM, has really led the industry to be much more quality conscious, much more responsive to recalls to protect, you know, the consumers, the drivers. I think that's been a really good change. I think, you know, the, the autonomous car, will come. I'm not sure I would get in one in Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you just think about the number of times your phone drops, that's the number of times you'll be without navigation. <laughs> and so, so but, I, but it will come. And I, I think electric vehicles will come. I think there's an interim step, a hybrid, where you have 1.9 liter diesel, you know, continually cycling to drive, charge batteries, you know, so that you have this hybrid, hybrid thing that doesn't give you range anxiety. And so there's, I think what's happening with blockchain, I think what's happening with infra, you know, the internet of things, what's happening with artificial intelligence, I think all are proof positive of the rate of change and the complexity that a CEO has to deal with. It's, uh, it's no longer, you know, I'm just gonna keep trying to you know, n niche up a little bit the products and services, I mean, we're looking at quantum changes, both from a cultural standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, you know, the globality with which you have to deal with today on supply chain. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming, and you can't be out there absorbing and trying to solicit as much advice and help with the complexity that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Any um, kind of notable leadership mistakes that you've witnessed uh, out there in the past couple of years? Well, I, I think if you look at some of the great to gone, mm -hmm. uh, we should do a postmortem, and we should think about what happened there and what are the lessons learned. Not to be critical, not to write articles or criticize people, but there's clearly things that if you look at Toys R Us, if you look at Sears and Kmart, if you you, know, you just go down the list uh, of companies that really were legendary. You know, I remember growing up and if I didn't, you know, my mom used to go down and polish her Kenmore washer. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, I swore by die hard batteries and weather beater paint. And, and Sears was such an integral part of a lot of the lives of people, you know, of my generation. And, and again, here it's gone, you know. And, and so I think there's lessons to be learned about omni-channel, the importance of that and making sure, look, I think one of the things Jeff does at Amazon is he, he presents solutions to customer dissatisfaction. And, and I think we can't listen long enough or hard enough to be market focused, customer back, customer centricity 
in what we're trying to present out there as solutions and service. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a speed round, and then I think we might have time for one or two questions, okay. so uh, start thinking. Um, what's your biggest productivity tip? Well, uh, don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you were famous for You got in the office at 6 a.m., left at 9 p.m. Yeah. Well, I'm still doing about 200 nights a year on the road, wow. and uh, I came in 7.20 this morning from L.A. just to be here with you. <laughs> and... and <laughs> No, I think it's, uh, no, I think, I think, you know, one of the lessons I learned from Jack, never ask anybody to do something you aren't willing to do. And I know that's an old cliche, but you've got to live by that. Uh, make sure you appreciate, recognize, and reward people that, you know, contribute to what appears to be your success when it's really their success. And you can't recognize them enough. Um, you can't, you know, the CEO is you know, the person, the buck stops here, but, you know, let's face it, without an unbelievably talented, committed, passionate organization that shares your commitment to success, you, you can't be successful as a CEO, yeah. chairman and CEO. So, and, and I think one final point, you know, a lot of people have a priority list that's vertical and they do things sequentially. You can't do that in today's world. You have to have a priority list that's horizontal and you're working concurrently. What, what has always worked for me is to assign, delegate, provide authority, but with authority comes responsibility and importantly, accountability. And so I always felt like I was kind of the coach allowing the men and women to do what their innate talents have prepared them to do, but then you know, continually interface, monitor, measure, account. And, and when you've got the whole organization from HR to finance, you know, working harmoniously, that's where you're going to get the most success and the most satisfaction. All right, here's my last question. What is the personality trait that you would say has been most key to your success? And on the flip side, what's the personality trait you've needed to work on the most? So uh, let me start with the flaws. <laughs> um, I have been criticized for being too granular in micromanaging. And so I don't do that to be disruptive. M my sense is, you know, having moved through so many different businesses and assignments, I think about 70% of what you do has portability, you know. And then the other 30%, you have to be a dry sponge, like in a bucket of water. And if I'm not coming up the, the learning curve vertically, when I went from GE to, to Home Depot, I'm pacing the rate of change for that company. So, and the only way for me to make informed, intelligent decisions is to try to learn. Uh, at Home Depot, I'd walk 300 stores a year, right? And, and it was important for me to understand merchandising, planogram, POS, et cetera. Uh, so I'm guilty of that, of trying to be as knowledgeable as I can to make informed decisions. So that's, that's one of the big flaws I, I would say that people would, 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 would criticize me for. I think reward and recognition. I think reaching out. One of the wonderful traits I learned from Jack is he could call anybody in the world and get data points. And the magic was his ability to you know, use the, connect the dots and provide strategic direction for all of General Electric. So I tried to emulate that as best I could as I was, you know, moving through various assignments and gaining more responsibility. Well, Bob, um, thank you so much for being here. It's been a real pleasure to be up here thank with you. you. I think we're all glad you didn't end up at Ponderosa. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking me too. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we might have time for one or two questions. A bunch. I'll start right here. Hi, Bob. Uh, just curious, uh, what your viewpoint on um, having a historically great and now currently talent and technologically rich company like GE get back on track under the uh, new leadership of Larry Culp is? So, um, Larry, uh, ironically, uh, Larry and I worked together up in Racine, Wisconsin. He was uh, he was an in summer intern. Uh, in a transmission plant there. And so 
listen, I've, I've spoken with Larry and I can't wish him the very best. I can't, uh, I've offered to help wherever I could. And I think one of the traits that Larry brings from his Danaher experience is being able to manage complexity of industrial companies, point number one. Point number two, he's a no-nonsense guy, right? Point number three, I like to say Larry's moving at what I'll call blink speed. And from experience going through this at Chrysler, uh, you need a quick yes, a quick no, and you can have no slow maybes. And I think, you know, the prior 14 months, there was a lot of slow maybes. And, and when you're burning cash, when you got 120 billion of, of debt, you got $30 billion of unfunded pension, you take a $23 billion charge for impaired assets on the, on the biggest acquisition you ever did in the history of the company, those are some of the things you gotta look back at and say, we kinda know how we got here. And so I think Larry's gonna move expeditiously. He's a good communicator. Uh, he's done a fabulous job at Danaher. His predecessor, uh, George Sherman, worked with me, he's a production control manager at uh, General Electric, and he started that whole transformation at Danaher, and Larry just took it from there. He'll do a great job. Good morning. Here. Where, oh, okay. oh. Here. hi. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your experience sharing. Um, one of the things that has changed lately is that we're seeing more and more female CEOs coming up. Um, and I would like to hear from you what is that, or is there a mix of skills and, um, if you want, soft skills as well, or attitudes that you would see uh, making female more successful in giving this step? Yeah. Well, you know, again, uh, w one of the proof points is uh, I have the privilege of serving on a committee that selects the CEO of the year, and we just named our first female. Uh, yeah. Marilyn Houston, yeah. Exactly. So, CEO of Lockheed Martin, of, Marilyn of Houston, Lockheed. who I just interviewed last week at one of our Fortune events. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think, I mean, there's evidence of um, a female that is doing a fabulous job being recognized not only by Fortune, uh, but also by CEO Magazine as CEO of the year. And, and I do think that uh, we are making progress uh, across corporate America, recognizing the value, the contribution, the equality issue that's, that's on the table frequently. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to force that at the top. We really have to start and provide the same opportunities that I had uh, through Crotonville, through uh, the, the, the training programs, being exposed to a number of different assignments to prepare females as well as we were preparing, you know, young men. And I think that there's an awareness now, there's a social uh, highlighting of that issue out there that I think you're gonna see a lot more progress. Uh, not only uh, running companies, but certainly on boards to have, you know, when you think about diversity, it's not only, uh, it's not only uh, ethnicity, it's not only gender, but I like to think the you know, diversity of opinion, of thought and mind is critically important when you're running a, a, a publicly traded corporation. Who else? Here you go. Uh, well, first, what a great privilege it is to hear from all of your wisdom. Um, so this talk has uh, been about the uh, rapid pace of change and how that's affected leadership. My question is, are there any fundamentals of leadership that have withstood the test of time, things that won't change no matter how much technology uh, disrupts? Yeah, great. Well, yeah, it's a great, and, and I think there are. I mean, I think I mentioned some of those. Uh, you know, we're still, we're still in an era where humans are critically important to a business. Now, we're fastly moving towards bots, robots, uh, to be able to do accounts payable, accounts receivable. So I think there still has to be uh, a very strong consciousness towards treating individuals with dignity and respect, recognizing and rewarding performance, point, point number one. I think today more than ever, um, as I look across this audience, uh, many of you are looking for corporations that have purpose, that have a clear mission, that understand the importance of social responsibilities. 
giving back to the communities where we're privileged to live, work, and make a living, right? Th those, those principles, I think, will continue to transcend. I don't think technology will, uh, will, will outdate or, or, or you know, dismiss the importance of that from my experience. Hello, so I'm an engineer and I also have an eight month old and working 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. is not really a reality I live in. And you mentioned culture eats strategy for breakfast. So how might we create cultures at organizations that are more flexible for people like me and parents like me? Yeah, no, that's a great question. That, that is a great question and, and uh, one that I have tremendous respect for. I, I've always told, you know, people would come to me and said, geez, Bob, we, we can't work the hours that you work. And I said, oh, I don't expect you to. I'm not as smart as you, and it takes me longer. And, <laughs> and I think, as I just mentioned, I think we're entering an era where uh, maybe in the past that could have been seen as, well, you're not committed. And I don't think there was the appreciation for the contribution, the diversity, uh, the level of, of uh, contribution that you could make, whether it's in four hours, right, that might take. So I always said, don't measure yourself in time. Measure yourself in accomplishment and contribution. So it, seriously, some people will just take longer to sort something out, but if you can get it done in four hours, you shouldn't hang around the hoop because management would criticize you if they didn't see you at your desk. I think that that environment is changing. And so I, I think that's a great question. And just like we're talking about diversity and recognizing the importance of female, I think that is changing also. And there, we're starting to see more flex and more appreciation, more working from home and so forth. And there's, there's just an awakening out there of the reality of what the workforce is transitioning into, and we have to be responsive to that. Yeah, that's a great question. And we'll do one more. There's one, someone down in front here. Yeah. It's an honor. I'm really happy to be here. This is great. Um, my question goes to what you said, from great to gone, and the environment, and responsibility, and accountability. So uh, the latest IPCC report has come out and said that we need to decarbonize the global economy by 2040, or we're doomed. So I just wondered, um, so you and the CEO as the hangout together, are we on track to decarbonize the economy in 20 years? Uh, say, say it again, please, the mic's not. Oh, the, the IPCC, the International yep. Panel of, okay. So their latest report says that we're seriously doomed. Um, we won't meet our targets unless we completely decarbonize the economy, take all the carbon out, yep. switch whatever we have to do yep. uh, by 2040. Yep. So that's two decades. Uh, Decar it's a huge thing, and um, I just wondered if we're on track. Yeah, so that is, a, uh, that is an ominous goal, given you know, where we are today, uh, the technology that we've become very comfortable with. Let's take an example. I was running GE Power Systems, and if you want to decarbonize, we would go with 100% nuclear, or we would go 100% renewable wind or we'd go 100% solar, right? And so we know in the US, there's no appetite for the first of the three that I mentioned. We're building two nuclear plants. The one in Georgia is probably now a $20 billion uh, enterprise as opposed to a 10. And so they're staying on course, but it's a cost plus contract now, given the bankruptcy at Toshiba and what's happened there. So we're doing onshore and offshore uh, wind, and we're continuing the cost uh, for solar is coming down, but it's more solar farms than it is a couple of panels on your roof. If you think about uh, in the auto industry, uh, we look more and more towards electric vehicles. Now, uh, we did an analysis of that at Power Systems, and if we took the car park, 260 million vehicles, and those were all electric, you could take a guess at how many more power plants we would have to build. So the question is, what type of, what type of power plants will we build? And you know, when we talk about uh, environmentally produced electrons, 
I always challenge people to say, how do you trace? You know, when you're, you say, well, I'm willing to pay more for that electron because it's, it's environmentally friendly. It, I, I challenge you to trace that electron <laughs> through the grid as to where it was produced. So I think, you know, regardless of regulations, I know the CEOs that I talk to are, are, are just as sensitive to your question to do that. But that has to happen on a global basis, uh, right to your point. So I think we're making a lot of progress. Whether we'll make it by that time frame, I'm not sure. But there's even greater challenges on a global scale, particularly as you look at Asia and some parts of, uh, of Europe. You know, if you look at the Gazprom pipeline, what Merkel's using, you know, to, to gasify some of the electrons over there. It's not perfect, but it's environmentally more friendly than, than coal, for example, or some of the other alternatives. So I think it's an admirable challenge. I think we gotta work on it. I think we have to be prepared to see significant capital investments and maybe some, uh, you know, some, cost, some cost impact as consumers. But it's a, that's a great question, yep. Great. Super. Thank you so much, Bob and Lee. Oh, thanks. Okay.